Tim Kilduff, and this is Business Matters. Business Matters introduces uh, HCAM viewers to people who manage and run local businesses. We're, in, in, you know, I start this all at, at almost every, every program saying we're fortunate to have, but we really, we really are fortunate to have an opportunity to have a conversation with Finn Perry uh, for a number of reasons. In, um, Finn, there, there's so much we can talk about, and I think it would be a mistake if we didn't talk a little bit about the company, F.H. Perry, uh, because people are interested, and I think people know you in the community, but I'm not so sure they know uh, a lot about the company, and, and also a little bit about your background. We don't have to start when you were born, <laughs> but we could, it, it, a little bit about your educational background, but either one would be a great place to start. Sure. Uh my educational background, my business background, and almost any of my, my adult life started when I moved to Hopkins in 1972. Um, I did get a political science degree from Stanford University in uh, 1969. Uh, worked for a few years for uh, Governor Sargent, who uh, I still think is wow. probably the best governor we've had in the last 50 years. Um, and then, uh, but got tired at that point of uh, working in a political environment where I felt I didn't have any control over uh, what I did every day. And I thought, aha, if I get myself into a uh, place where I can be a carpenter, where I can build things, um, then I'll have something to show for every day's work. Little did I know that as that business expanded and I realized that I really wasn't a terribly good carpenter, but was a pretty good businessman, uh, that everything is politics and sales, and uh, gradually uh, the, the company kind of grew from one person to two people to nine people to 16 people <clears throat> through the 80s. Um, and then in 1990, we were very fortunate to have what really amounted to a construction depression around here. Fortunate from my point of view and from my business, uh, because at that point, uh, it was... Uh, it was really heartbreaking. I had to lay off everybody who was working for me, except for a couple of them. Uh, but that gave me a chance to reinvent uh, the residential construction business as I was doing it, uh, which is to say, in the, uh, when I was started, my whole process was to just hire people, and I'd hire a guy, and then hire a friend of the guy, and then hire a friend of that guy, and so on and so forth. And, when I laid everybody off in the 90s, that gave me a chance to say, all right, what kind of people do I want to do I want to hire? And at that point, I really became a business, and that became actually a way that was pretty much of a standard for the way the business is run today. We run it very much like a, a commercial construction business, um, have nothing but managers um, and uh, uh, office people keeping track of budgets and uh, that sort of thing here in Hopkinton, and then we have field managers running the work, and it's all done with subcontractors that we've been using for years. So it's turned into a very good business over the 20 years from, uh, 25 years really, from 1990 to uh, 2015. The, uh, you mentioned uh, settling in Hopkinton. Are you a New Englander by birth? Yes, I, I grew up in Dover. Oh, okay, so, so you were familiar with uh, at least this eastern Massachusetts when you settled here? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, we could spend uh, the next 30 minutes talking about what you've seen happen to Hopkins, and maybe we can save a few minutes for that, because I want to talk to you about your, your, uh, your interest in, uh, in understanding and expertise in, uh, in planning, because you've been involved in a lot of that. Uh, when, how big's the company now? Uh, in terms of personnel, it's about uh, 25 people. In terms of business, about 20 million uh, business volume. Uh, which is uh, all is a there's a mix of small remodeling projects, large home, uh, whole house kind of projects. Uh, much of the work is in the city. Uh, we've had a developed over the last uh, five or six years a very successful piece of the company called uh, F.H. Perry Home as opposed to F.H. Perry Builder. And Home uh, is the continuing care division, if you will, of the company. And it's interesting because from a business point of view, that kind of work, while it's not particularly glamorous, uh, is much more profitable than uh, construction but margins being what they are these days. You know, there was, uh, and I would recommend, by the way, um, that people go to the 
fhperry.com uh, website. Um, the, the, the way it's laid out is terrific, but the, the way it captures some of the projects that the company's worked on, yeah. there's, some, there's some pretty phenomenal stuff, pretty high-end stuff. Uh, but you talk that you, on the site, you talk about this um, uh, people moving into their homes, and then how do you how do you keep it keep it up? It, I mean, there's wear and tear and all that. So that's the is that the basis of the of the sort of the 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 work that you do in the city when you work on Beacon Hill and some of these sites? Yeah, exactly. I mean, F. H. Perry Builder will do the project, and then people move in, and there's a period of. Um, uh, commissioning, we call it, where uh, like a, a naval ship or a submarine, you know, if you uh, you have sea trials, and some of these projects are complicated enough where uh, you just can't expect it to be perfect uh, the day you walk out the door, dusting everything off, and <laughs> so you have to. We'll really spend probably, you know, depending on the complexity of the project, as much as a year continuing to work on it. And then there's an ongoing maintenance, uh, just the kinds of things that you do on a seasonal basis to change out filters and clean windows and uh, take care of just living in a complex house. And that is all the work that F.H. Perry Home does uh, in contrast to F.H. Perry Builder. So you, ha you, have a, you had a political science degree. How in the world did you, did, did, did you uh, when you started your business, did you anticipate all of these, these various factors? <laughs> like, you, know, you know, staffing, for example, and... Yeah. and no, of course not. I think uh, I've been a person who all my life has just followed my nose, you know. I'm, I'm smart enough to see things and do things, but I'm mostly, much as you and I have talked about the need to plan for things, I'm pretty much a person who reacts. And when opportunity presents itself, then I'll move in that direction. And uh, so I was always comfortable with a certain kind of clientele. And as much as anything, the clientele and the architects and the tradesmen that I've worked with over the years have been the people who've really taught me the business. So the political, the, the, I want to try to connect and, and understand your, your training academically had to, had to set you up in terms of dealing with diverse, diverse groups of people, I would think. Yeah, I, well, it does all that. And I, you know, I, my whole educational uh, growing up, you know, I, I, I'm a private school kid. I went to private elementary school in Dover and I went to Milton Academy and then I from there went to Stanford. And so I've always been exposed to, uh, to people who are smart and sophisticated and traveled. And uh, consequently, I've always been pretty comfortable with that kind of clientele. And I think, you know, I, but I've also been very comfortable with uh, people in the trades, and uh, I've tried to, I've tried to learn from the people that I've met in life. I've I've never been particularly academic, you know. I, I even spent uh, spent three weeks once at Harvard Business School, and I frankly, just didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> there's a certain you know, I like business and I like making money, but I, uh, there's a certain quality to the way business gets done in this country, and I sort of put it at the feet of Harvard Business School and some of the other elite schools like that, that I, uh, it just, it, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm a person who likes to be transparent in the things I do, and uh, I don't feel that getting the upper hand is necessarily the best way to do business. I like to make sure everybody's a winner. Did you work for Sergeant right out of school? Yes. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Well, that was that was fun in the sense that I moved back to Boston. Uh, I was married at the time, still am the same woman. Uh, just celebrated our 48th wedding anniversary last week. Um, and she immediately got a job, uh, which her father thought she would do, and uh, he said he thought it would take me somewhat longer, <laughs> <laughs> and it did. Uh, but I interviewed with a bunch of different people uh, in state government because I was interested in that, in real estate because I was interested in that, and in environmental affairs because I was interested in that. And somehow or other, you know, I had a resume that I handed each of these people as I went around. 
And one day I got a call from uh, Governor Sargent's chief secretary that said, I've got four copies of your resume sitting on my desk that came from different directions. I think I need to talk to you. So I went in. Wow. And <laughs> that was, uh, I was there for three years and uh, enjoyed that immensely. Wow. So that, that, that's uh, not typical, at least from my perspective, of what you would, you would think would happen in terms of working for a governor. There are a lot of people that work out in the fields, work on campaigns, yeah, that sort of yeah. you, you thing. You came straight through on, 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 your, on your background and, your, and the quality of your resume. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And I grew up in Dover, and Frank Sargent came from uh, Dover, okay. and so my name was familiar to him because my father's name is the same as his, and my father was in his class at Noble and Greenham School. <laughs> you just have to play everything, right? You know, that, that, that's, again, one of the things I'm continually amazed about when we have these kind of conversations with hopping and business people is there, that, that, that's pretty straightforward, makes sense, doesn't it? What you learn. And, and, uh, and yet we make it, uh, make it so, so complicated. Yeah. The, um, you're not running the company on a day-to-day -day basis now. So tell me a little bit about that transition and, uh, and who's in charge. Well, that's a very interesting, uh, I, one of the other things I do in life is uh, I have a, a sailing boat that I've taken all across the North Atlantic up into the Arctic and so forth. And uh, I was somewhat afraid that somewhere along the line I would, you know, I'd fall overboard and uh, that would be that. And my, whoever was left behind would be left with a business that had some uncertain value. So in order to kind of correct that from an estate planning point of view, I uh, turned that into a loan. Uh, that is, I sold it to my daughter and her business partner, who was really a construction guy. My daughter is a business person and an uh, HR person, really, um, with the idea that, OK, now that asset is a loan. And I would still, you know, I'd be there running the thing and working with them. But because I was gone every summer for six or eight weeks, uh, when I came back, they'd been struggling to run everything and actually doing a really an outstanding job. And after a while, they said, you know what? If we're going to own this company, we're going to run it. And you can just kind of <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> back off. So uh, I mean, we did that for a couple of years. Uh, but really, the, what I learned is that I was more in their way and holding them back from really. When I ran that company, we were uh, maybe a five, six, seven, eight million dollar business. They had no choice in this recent downturn to, but to grow the top line in order to keep it profitable. And uh, Bill and Allison, uh, Bill Cosman and Allison and I and Tosca, uh, who were the owners there, they were smart enough to realize that they had to sell more work in order to make the same amount of money on the bottom line and been able to do the uh, appropriate profit sharing with the employees and that sort of thing. So that's what happened. They just uh, took off on their watch and they've got uh, far stronger relationships with architects than I had, um, far stronger uh, connections with various tradesmen and suppliers, uh, very sophisticated people from all over the country are supplying into this market and into this business for us. Uh, the timing, the sense of that, did you, did you have a sense that that was, that, that was going to come to a point like that? Well, I, you know, <laughs> So I'm 68 years old. It's time for me to be moving on doing something else, which I wanted to do anyway. Um, and some of you know that, uh, you certainly know, that I uh, partnered up with Stephen Zeef over the last couple of years on this Crossroads project. So this, by separating myself from F.H. Perry, it gave me a chance to do something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, what has been a little disappointing, uh, I'll have to be honest, was, uh, you know, I've been, I was president of the State Builders Association, president of the Greater Boston Builders Association, invited, involved with the National Association of Home Builders on their executive board. I've been on various uh, boards in Boston. And uh, I really thought, well, the phone would start to ring. Uh, now that you're free, you can do a lot of different things. And it has to some extent, but not a lot. And so I will honestly say that it's been an interesting adjustment to try to 
you know, figure out exactly what I want to do here. Mm. I, I just want to go back a little bit, uh, just uh, one point with Allison. I, uh, in my, uh, my in-depth research, uh, there was a group in Boston, uh, Commonwealth Institute, that uh, named her one of the top um, 100 women leading businesses in Massachusetts. That, you, that must make you feel terrific. It's fabulous. That was something, uh, that's two years in a row. Um, she was, they were nominated, uh, it's, the, it's the top 100 women-run businesses in, I don't know whether it's in Boston or Massachusetts, but it's, uh, but it's done in conjunction with the Globe, and the Globe uh, publicizes it, so you get quite a splashy breakfast and then uh, 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 public affairs announcement and so forth. It's, so it's a nice thing. Um, two years ago, I went to the breakfast with Alice, and that was fun to see who the other women were. And uh, this year, I didn't go because I wasn't invited. But uh, <laughs> she uh, she was number 100. So that created an opportunity for her to. That she puts out a monthly newsletter, and it's always sort of a little commentary on how she's feeling about things. And so. To be number 100 in the top 100 women-run businesses has sort of raised a question. You know, I'm not 99; I'm 100. What does that exactly mean? And she went on this whole riff about that. It was quite entertaining. The well, as I said, it must make you you uh, and Trish feel pretty uh, pretty terrific. Very proud uh, of her. Good yeah. for you. The let's spend some time on, if you don't mind, on um, planning. Hopkinton, you've got now a hand. Right? You've had a hand. You've had a hand in uh, the East Hopkinton Master Plan, which drove that whole process. Which uh, I think most. I haven't heard anybody anybody say anything negative about that. But now you 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 have some property. You you tried to create a, a plan for that, um, and I'm sure you're not through with that. I hope not. Anyway, uh, th th Here's a person that's capable, that's, that, that's uh, built a, a, a very good business, a strong business. You think in a planning sense. Uh, and to start to butt up against some of the little roadblocks that, that pop up all over the place, it's got to be a little frustrating, I would think. Well, it's interesting. I, I, Hopkinton is what it is. And uh, you and I have talked about this a lot. And, you know, I. People come here because it's a it's a comfortable town. It's a safe town. It's located in a in a great location, really at the epicenter of New England economy and transportation, with 495 and the Turnpike intersecting right in town. So, uh, but people come here because the education system is good, and there's a good housing stock that's relatively new. And if you buy into town, typically you're housing prices go up. So as long as my education, the education for my kids is good and uh, property values continue to go up, that's the way I like it. Don't do anything to screw it up. And I think, you know, that sort of is my sense of this community. Um, every once in a while, something comes along that is, uh, presents itself as a, a threat to that. And uh, 10 years ago, that threat was the sudden sale of Western Nurseries. And, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Uh, well, it might have made some sense for the town prior to that to have done a little bit of planning with the realization that Western Nurseries, which even though it doesn't, but it feels like it represents a whole quarter of the town and the northwest quadrant, northeast quadrant, um, but suffice it to say, no, we had not done any planning, and it just was always assumed that a nursery would stay a nursery and we don't have to worry about it. Well, we have a similar situation uh, down in the southeast quadrant with the Laborers Training Center and the, um, uh, the YMCA. YMCA property, right? Uh, there's 400 acres down there that could come up for sale someday when, if those one of those institutions said, you know, we've. This just doesn't make any sense. So I, when we did the East Hopkinton, uh, the Land Use Study Committee did the East Hopkinton plan, uh, we incorporated those properties into it, but it very quickly sort of pulled back and focused entirely on Western Nursery. 
That was a good process, and as you say, I think uh, we're seeing the fruition of the planning now coming into play uh, with Legacy Farms. And the construction process is messy, but uh, the ultimate outcome, I think, is pretty close to where we wanted to be with it. How do we, so that was a threat, and that motivated a lot of people to say, oh my God, what do we do? We don't have a threat now in the same way around land use, but we do have some of the same challenges, I think. And one of the challenges is uh, the Elmwood Park, Industrial Park, four property owners in there, every single one of those four properties is currently for sale. Uh, don't worry about Perk and Elmer, they're staying, but the landlord that owns those buildings wants to sell them. Um, and then there is a, a big empty building down in back that probably is something of a secret. It's 160,000 square feet that's um, been empty since 2001. Empty. Uh, and then there are some uh, industrial flex buildings that I own with partners, and those really are uh, fully depreciated and need to be torn down and something else built there. But how do we kind of, as a community, decide what we want to have there? And Stephen Zeef and I had uh, proposed a really elaborate plan, very intense development, which we thought would, would work, would bring some vitality to an area that needs it, would provide some uh, retail and uh, hospitality services that the town really could use. Uh, but I think, again, uh, we incorporated a large residential component, and that was, I think, of some concern to the planning board. So they essentially shot it down, and I'm not sure whether anybody is really ready to look at what should go there. Uh, we don't think that without more people, uh, residential, uh, uh, retail and hospitality will work very well. Uh, you just you need customers, and people who live here are the ones that are the customers we need. Now the same, the, the, you, you can translate the, the customer issue. I would think gets uh, you could translate that into what the the, the downtown and uh, restaurants not be, really not having having uh, not having done very well here. Those sorts of things. There's there's this corridor now right. that gets created, and, and, it, and my I, my sense is that there isn't there is not a lot of planning around that. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I th you know, it, it's really the way planning boards are set up. I mean, they call them planning boards, but they're really uh, they're hearing boards, uh, and that's not the fault of Hopkinton. That's the fault of the state statutes that uh, create the zoning. Uh, uh, and to be fair to Hopkinton, the Zoning Advisory Committee is the arm of the planning board that actually does planning. And I think that, you know, in many ways that's been effective. I think it could do a lot more, uh, whether it should be called the Zoning Advisory Committee or whether there should be something uh, called a Long Range Planning Committee, and uh, that would incorporate that kind of, the kind of planning that we're talking about. If you, uh, if you, we're in a position to uh, to wave the magic wand and say this is this is uh, these are the steps that we need to take now to think about what's going to happen ten years from now. What would that look like? Well, I think we we have to look at uh, what the population trends are, uh, what the transportation. Uh, I like Stephanie Pollock, the new Secretary of Transportation. She doesn't talk about transportation or traffic. She talks about connectivity. And I think that is really what we, the way we want to talk about things. Uh, what are the factors that, that connect us all as human beings to each other? Um, and within that is traffic management. But Hopkinton really needs uh, to look at traffic management. It needs to look at its uh, uh, long-range financial planning picture, and it needs particularly to look at land use planning. Um, and it, we, we've got the beginnings of that the, uh, with a visioning uh, group that you were with last year, uh, created a, a statement of vision for the future, and I think building on that, we could pick up on those, uh, those three legs of that stool, the, the finance, transportation, and land use planning. What happens if we don't? Well, then we have 
continue to get what we get. Congestion. Uh, well, we get some congestion. Uh, we get congestion. We get development that uh, takes us by surprise, like the replacement for the Golden Spoon, which seems like it would be a good thing, like the uh, sale of Colellas, which is uh, pe some people are very worried about right now. Uh, we get uh, the sale of Western Nursery, which came as a complete shock. If we're not thinking about what we're going to do with these properties when those that have been controlling them for 40 years decide they've had enough, uh, we're going to constantly be reacting. Who's the responsibility then? Is it, uh, is, it, is it the planning board? Is it the selectmen? Is it, is, it, is it a group of residents? Well, I think it's you and me as much as anything. I think it's important for people to, to just be thinking out, you know. Most people who live here, in, in my view, uh, don't really want to think about the future. I mean, they want to think about their kids' future. They want to think about their personal futures in their work and in their, uh, how they're growing and succeeding in life. Um, they don't really want to worry about Hopkins, and Hopkins will kind of take care of itself. And in many ways, it will. It has for the last 40 yeah, years, yeah, you know, yeah. so uh, that I've been here. But uh, you know, many people say Hopkins has changed dramatically in 40 years. I'm not sure I agree with that necessarily. I think that one of the things that has been terrific about Hopkinton is some of the people that were running the town when I first got here 40 years ago are still here, like yeah. John Duffy yeah. and yeah. John Palmer. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, these, uh, the, the speed of this, these, these discussions always amazes me. We've, we've run out of time. However, I think uh, what we ought to be doing is get two or three people. You could pick them if you like and uh, set up a, an opportunity to sit around the table uh, here at HCAM and talk more about this planning issue. Absolutely critical. Uh, I particularly appreciate the, your thoughtfulness about the community. Uh, I think, and I hope if we've done nothing else, we've given people a little under, uh, uh, more understanding about your, uh, your background, both academically and business-wise. So we appreciate uh, your time, and we'll look forward to the next discussion. Well, it's my pleasure. If we can talk planning here, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah.